Good morning. Can everybody hear me? The mic's on here. It's my honor this morning to introduce to you the 2022 McElhaney lecturer, Kevin McGillicuddy, PG. Uh, Kevin is the chief hydrogeologist for Roscoe Moss Company, specializing in groundwater development. He has designed several hundred high capacity water supply wells, conducted numerous well siting studies, and managed large and small scale rehabilitation projects. Prior to joining Roscoe Moss, Kevin worked as director of recharge operations and as senior hydrogeologist for the Orange County Water District in Fountain Valley, uh, California. While at OCWD, he engaged in groundwater replenishment projects utilizing both surface water, recharge, and direct injection of highly treated reclaimed water through a system of injection wells. Um, Kevin's presentation for you today is uh, called Surface Water and Groundwater Interaction, an Examination of the Natural and Man-Made Ties that Bind Them. Let's have a warm welcome for Kevin McGillicuddy. Hi. Thank you, Marvin, and thank you for everyone who got up this morning to come, come hear this talk. Um, like most of the other speakers who've had this role prior to me, and what they've said really holds true for me as well. Um, I'm really honored to have been even thought of as a candidate to be the McElhaney speaker, so I really want to thank and appreciate very much those who nominated me and secured this position for me, and I'll do my best to serve, serve this industry very well and keep the uh, ball rolling along with the other McElhaney speakers who are, some of them are in this very room, and continue on the tradition of putting on a great talk, I hope. Um, I also want to thank uh, the National Groundwater Association and particularly the uh, National Groundwater Foundation for sponsoring this, this talk here and uh, for my future activities in 2022. I also want to thank uh, Roscoe Moss Company for allowing me to go on this speaking tour and conducting this all of next year. But as Marvin said, my talk today, when I was asked to you know, provide these series of talks, was, had to do with surface and groundwater interaction. And it was kind of a challenge when I was first offered this because I said, well, you know, how am I going to make this subject matter important to the water well drilling community? So with a little bit of thought, I said, well, okay, well, yes, surface water and groundwater, they're combined. And as I go through the next hour's worth of uh, presentation material, I'm trying to make, sh make sure everyone understands clearly, we all have a role to play. Whether Mother Nature can't do it all herself with recharging these groundwater systems that we enjoy and make a living producing water from, sometimes you need some help. You need some man-made help, some engineering help to get this task done. So let's cover a couple of those projects and talk about what our role is in all of this. So you are here. You can pick out your home. This is where you live. So a little bit of background. We know what the Earth's made of, earth and water. 70% of that is water, 30% is land. Of the Earth's water supply, 97% of it is saline and therefore unusable. The, of the remaining 3% that is fresh, 2.5% is still unavailable. It's tied up in the ice caps, it's tied up in glaciers, snow caps, um, or it's polluted or too deep to go after economically. So that leaves 0.5%, half of 1% of fresh water that is available for us to use. And that's also tied up in lakes, rivers, streams, and groundwater. If you just wanted to take what simply the groundwater component is, it could be less than half of that, the attainable groundwater that we all use. One important thing to remember too, since, the time, since this planet was formed, the amount of the Earth's water has never changed. What we utilize now and what we enjoy now and what we practice getting out of the ground now has never changed. All right? It has changed a different form. It's either one of three forms, a solid, liquid, gas. It's either in the liquid phase in the oceans, lake streams, or it's a solid ice caps and glaciers, or it's in the atmosphere as a gas. And that's what we know, and that's what we know we have. So, We've bottled our water. We know what our limited supply is. We get no more, we get no less. So this is how we, well, we perceive it. And so the best way to illustrate this, as we all know, is through the water cycle. 
So as you can see, you know, you've got, you know, lakes and streams, the oceans or whatever. You'll have a, the process of evaporation, takes that, takes that moisture, puts it in the air, it condenses, and that condensation falls then. If, if it's at higher altitude, it's going to be snow. If it's going to be a lesser added, warmer climate, it's going to be rain. So that trickles off across the ocean, across the land surface. Some of that percolates in. At the very bottom of the slide here, you can see that the term groundwater is there. So there's your 0.1%, 0.2% or so that this industry chases. This is what we're after. If you want to put it in another perspective, let's just say um, anybody from NGWA want to yell out, what, what is the, what is the uh, current uh, membership of NGWA? Anybody can throw out a number? 10,000? Yes, what? 250? Okay, so nationwide, let's just say there might be, oh, a million people involved in the groundwater industry, and that's just our country, let's say. So if you look worldwide, if there were eight million groundwater people, drillers, scientists, operators, treatment system operators, and so forth, eight million people out of the eight billion people known to populate the earth, that's 0.1%. So you've got 0.1% of the world's population chasing 0.2% of the Earth's water. So it begs the question, a couple of them, you know, why the heck did I pick this field? The second one is, <laughs> you're a very unique group of individuals. People who have chosen to go after that 0.2% of water for their lifetime, for their uh, vocation, is something to be very proud of. So I hope, I hope we all think that way, and I hope we all you know, go through our lives and our daily jobs and realize how important the job we do really, really is and how many people it does impact. In terms of the age of the groundwater, so the groundwater percolates in. Um, surface runoff comes in, percolates in the ground. You can look at it in terms of different ages as well. We talk about groundwater recharge. We're kind of thinking in that upper zone there. There's three different aquifers here separated by confining beds, or clays if you were. Um, most of the time, what we're trying to extract and produce is water from the, you know, readily attainable aquifers, the shallower ones shown here, for example, or an unconfined aquifer in some cases. And that could be, as shown in the diagram here, relatively young. Okay, so you're looking at water that could be days, weeks, decades old. You drill a little deeper, now you're getting water that's maybe centuries old. You go way deep, maybe because over the, century, over the uh, decades here, in some areas of the country, you've got to go very deep, drill for new water sources, and that can be, you know, centuries old or over a thousand years old, simply because it hasn't been extracted before, and if it's not extracted, it hasn't been replenished. So it's just sitting there. Now, that deepest water that's always, that's maybe fairly old, doesn't mean it's always read, readily available uh, for drinking either. It probably and most likely needs a significant amount of treatment. But in discussion of surface water quality, and again, without belaboring the point, there's two very simple principles that I'll address. And one is the quantity and quality of surface water. And if you look at the surface water quality, what really, really influences it? And some of the major ones are obviously those associated with land use, such as industrial uses and discharges, agricultural uses, application of fertilizers, for example, um, improper sanitation. This means you know, inappropriate discharges from, say, water treatment plants, sewage treatments plants. So we see how those kinds of surface interactions can affect lakes and streams, which in turn can affect groundwater. And these two examples, you can look at the one on the left, you're looking at what's called a gaining stream. So in this case, the elevation of the base of that stream is below the static groundwater level, below the water table. So therefore, this high water table actually feeds the stream. And therefore, much like water moving through a tea bag, that water moving below ground and intercepting the stream can contribute, say, through the different types of geology it's moving through different elements. And then that stream then carries those elements, you know, downstream to be deposited or associated with other water bodies later on. So for example, you can, you can mobilize some dissolved constituents, some of the natural ones, including iron and manganese, for example. So you can sort of, again, leach those from the groundwater you know, geological beds, and now they become transported 
only to be deposited somewhere else downstream. In the case on the right, what you're looking at is a losing stream. In this case, this is more the co more common type. You're looking at that stream, and as it continues on its way, it's actually feeding a you know unconfined zone or into that water table. So it's actually contributing different water quality factors to that zone. So in cases like these, you maybe if it's coming off an agricultural area that's been exposed to a lot of fertilizers, you can be carrying certain nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Or for example, like we see today, pollutants like TCE and PFAS. This is one way we've noticed the transmission of PFAS over large areas, even though the application of it may have been in certain industrial applications, military bases and so forth, but it has moved very far because it's very hard to break down. A lot of you are familiar with the PFAS situation and you know how long lived that is. It's, 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 a, you know, it's known not to break down, it's a forever chemical. So once it gets mobilized by the surface water, it can go a long way. Take that same surface water, put it in a recharge basin, now it's underground and it's gonna be underground for a long time. So these are things we need to recognize in the industry and that we're going to have to be the ones to address them. If you look at other water supply sides of this of surface water, groundwater issue, under natural conditions, so in the next series of slides, you see this is what you get. Under everyday conditions, if we didn't you know, produce water from the ground, yes, this is what we'd have, the water cycle situation. You've got evaporation, goes to the clouds, precipitates, lands on the water, lands on the ground, percolates below grade, fine. If you have a stream down below, it feeds the stream. Nice situation, nice closed circle here of what happens. But next, if you construct a well, now you change the system. Now I'm putting demand on that groundwater system, which also, if not control, I can pull water off that stream too. So now, now I'm not just uh, affecting the local groundwater situation, I, I can also impact the flow rate going to, into that stream. And if I'm not careful about how I balance that situation, you know, I can, I can dewater the the, the local area around that stream caused harm to the you know, native fish, for example, or the local, if this was a farm, I can drive the local crops, for example, and other types of agricultural uh, uses can suffer if I'm over pumping in these types of situations. So what we're endeavoring to do is called groundwater management practices. So what you do, you wanna be able to extract the groundwater in such a manner and at such a volume that you're keeping everything moving on as it naturally is. So on the top and bottom slides on this on the shelf, on this on this slide here, you see that it's the same situation. Only I've introduced a water well, but it's it's producing in a manner that's keeping up with the natural recharge, and that's the ideal way to operate a groundwater system, or an ideal way to manage a groundwater system. Now, when Mother Nature can't support that type of system, and like we have certainly in the Western U.S. and some of the drought. Uh, drought-laden uh, areas throughout the world, you need to, you need to help augment that system. Mother Nature just can't keep up, and nor does she always supply all the water you need. So we have this new system of groundwater management called groundwater replenishment. So through engineering means, artificial means, we're taking water from one source, treating it, and putting it back underground. So we're doing Mother Nature's job when she can. So and then we also, we have these enhancements of groundwater resources for use in the future when we need them. Now this, this very organization, NGWA, has recognized these types of programs because back in 2013, uh, the National Groundwater Association nominated the City of Phoenix and awarded City of Phoenix um, the project of the year. And this, that project was the Innovations in Aquifer Storage and Recovery, also known as ASR, in well technologies. And shown accepting the award here is Gary Jinn at the time was with the City of Phoenix. That tall guy in the middle, I think you know him. I think he's Marvin. <laughs> And behind him is Jeff Wolf, one of the uh, contractors who also worked on the project. So this, this program, and what I'm talking about today, it should be, it's, it's, no, it's not a strange uh, concept to this group. But I'll just take two examples um, and compare and contrast them here in the United States. So on the west, say the western U.S., we'll talk about the experience from Orange County, California. At least I have some background in this, so I thought it'd be a good example to, to utilize, and that's talking about the groundwater replenishment system uh, built and managed by the Orange County Water District in Southern California. I'll have an East Coast example I'll discuss, and this is the, located in Virginia Beach, 
and it's the Hampton Road Sanitation District's SWIFT program. All right, so we'll discuss and compare each one of these two programs and what they're doing today to help resolve the groundwater shortage and water quality issues that each one of these agencies, agencies face. So let's go, let's go to the, uh, the West Coast side of things and talk about water management in the West. Now you could spend weeks talking about you know, water management in the Western US. It's been fought over for, for decades, not liable to end anytime soon. But it all stems from this. What you're trying to do is balance water supplies between periods of drought and limited surface water. All right, so we look at runoff in the West as you know, being our major surface water supplier. If it doesn't snow, we're not getting runoff in the spring, and therefore we're not going to have very much in terms of supply from our rivers and streams. Um, and we're also con constantly facing drought. We're on the worst, worst drought periods we're in right now. Shown here on this map, many of you may be familiar with this, but this is the, from the U.S. Drought Monitor. You can go online and review it. Uh, basically, if you're in the white or light yellow, you're, you're good. But if you're in that dark red or maroonish, not so good. That means you're in drought conditions and uh, you're probably stressing your system for water. So taking the Orange County Water District example and looking at what they are geographically and what they've done, um, they utilize the surface water supply from the Santa Ana River to augment their groundwater supply. So this is an overhead look at their basin. They're located in the Southern California. You can see that white star in the upper, upper right. So that's where they're loaded between, between Los Angeles and, and San Diego counties. And the blow up on the major part of the screen, we see that the Santa Ana River pretty much runs right down the heart of Orange County through the major part of its basin. It's an alluvial filled basin a couple thousand feet deep. You know, sediments are uh, you know, tens of thousands of years old and has a highly complex aquifer system. There's lots of faulting going on, various water quality differ differences between those different aquifers, all of which I'll talk about in a minute. For another view of these, uh, uh, of this system and how its impacts on the river and how the uh, uh, flooding impacts in the past have now mandated how the, di how the river is operated now, um, I point out the Prado Dam because Orange County suffered a series of floods you know, at the turn of the century and up through the mid-1900s. Uh, and due to those flood events, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers stepped in and built the Prado Dam in 1941. So the dam is located here, just where I put that arrow there, at the northern tip of the Orange County Water District Service area. Okay, so that holds back water. That dam is owned and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers as a flood control mechanism. Okay, and again, this type of scenario is not different than many others throughout the United States and again throughout the world, but you have competing operating management uh, goals here. The Army Corps of Engineers wants flood control, so therefore they want to store behind that dam as little as possible and have constant discharge at a reasonable level so that you don't flood the downstream areas of Orange County. Yet they don't want to cause a large backup you know, upstream from them either. So they want to have a constant level of discharge they want to release. Orange County Water District that owns the property just, you know, south of the dam or downstream of the dam, they, they say, okay, let, let's work on this. We want the discharges regulated. We want them monitored and at a rate we can capture. We want to divert that water off the river to our recharge basins in, a, in such a rate that we can percolate that water and use it. So, okay, fine. So there's a there's a contract between the Army Corps of Engineers and the Water District to do just that. Further on down the stream from there, you've got Orange County Flood Control, who's in, again, back into the flood control business. They want to say, we don't want standing water in this river. We want constant flows, again, moving it to the ocean, we're all fine. At the terminal end is the Orange County Sanitation District. <laughs> so they take all the water that gets past all the recharge basins, downstream from the Santa Ana Flood Control uh, District, and what they'll do is they'll divert some of that water and treat it. And I'll go through that because that's part of the GWRS program I'll talk about. But the bottom picture here, talk about Prado Wetlands, just to go back to the dam for a second. Um, OCWD has made use of the land upstream of the dam because like I talked before, the, the surface water quality impacts behind the dam, all of that flow is coming in from an area that once, was once dominated by agricultural and dairies. So that surface water is not very desirable for the drinking water, for drinking water purposes. It's got to be treated. 
by running it through those series of man-made wetlands. You see how this, it's, it's a structured flow system. Those bays and ponds that are, that are they, those were built and engineered such that the water has to take a course through there. And the root systems of the plants in there help take out the nitrogen and phosphorus in that water. So by the time it is released from the Prado, Prado Dam downstream, what gets recharged into the Orange County Basin is water where most of the nutrients have already been taken away. So that's one less step the district has to take before it uh, serves it to the public or before it recharges it as well. Then I'll put the one last uh, arrow here. The other part of Orange County Water District's uh, focus here is recycled water injection. So again, once the water, if they can't percolate it all in, those no in the northern regions where the percolation ponds are, the water during high flows, storm events, for example, that will get taken up, treated, and put back into the ground through a series of injection wells. So just a little review of what the district's you know, goals are. They were formed in 1933, and they, they are the guardians of the Santa Ana River for this particular reach. Um, they manage and protect the Orange County groundwater basin in over approximately 280 square mile area. Uh, they provide that high quality and reliable drinking groundwater for their service area. Now they don't collect a, a fee from the individual users themselves. What this, what this agency does is a management agency. They'll let, they, they operate by saying, all right, the overlying, the overlying cities in Orange County, Santa Ana, Anaheim, Garden Grove, Fullerton, these types of cities, they pay a fee to have Orange County waters fill that basin so those cities' wells can produce up to 70 to 80 percent of their demand. The remaining 20 to 30 percent is made up of imported water. So that's, what, that's how Orange County manages this basin. We'll fill it up, you cities use all you want up to your maximum allowance, but we'll always keep that basin full for you. Um, there's 19 municipal and special water districts in the area, and there's over two and a half million customers that they serve. So if you look at the upper part of the Santa Ana River, just south of the Prado Dam, downstream of the dam, uh, we look at this in terms of an upper and lower system. In the upper system, this is where you divert the water off the river to these series of basins. Now some of the basins have been engineered and built by the district, but some very early on, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, what these are, are they were former quarry pits. So there were operations that removed the sands and gravels for commercial use, industrial use. But now they become great because of their high percolation rate. So you've got to basically get a deep pit, steep walls. It's a perfect, oper perfect operation to run a recharge operation in. So they took advantage of these off-river basins that were available and, and divert water to them. On the bottom, you see how they have on the bottom right uh, that's one of the larger uh, ponds, that, recharge ponds that they have. In the center, that's one of the inflatable dams. To get the water diverted off the river, you have to take it, have a sharp, sharp, uh, sharp turn to the right here. So what you do is this, this dam now is in the lowered position. During high flows, they must lower the dam. But no, during normal operations, when the base flow conditions, you know, a few tens of CFS, that dam will be inflated, and that diverts water then off the Sand Ann River into the recharge pond system. And then on the far left, on the bottom, what you're looking at is a series of TNL levees. Again, these are, these are built by uh, a lot of D9s, bulldozer equipment that goes into the river and actually builds those. And the purpose of the levees is actually to distribute the flow from bank to bank, as well as slows the, the velocity down so the, the water has time to percolate. Again, a quick view in the available dams. You see it in the fully inflated position on, on the top right, and you, now it's fully diverting water. You can see on the, on, the, uh, on the left side of the picture that's standing water behind the dam. Downstream on the right-hand side, it's fairly dry. And then when the dam has to be lowered, you see it deflated, and of course the river maintains its way. Now again, if you look at the larger picture here, this is the heart of Orange County. So you're looking at probably the central part of Anna, Anaheim and Santa Ana. Off to the right, and blown up on the right, you see a closer look at the TNL levee systems within that river. And just to give you some geographic reference, I threw in those three circles. I didn't, I didn't get permission from the mouse, the mighty mouse, to use their logo. But I think you can guess what that is. That's the happiest place on Earth, otherwise known as Disneyland. <laughs> also shown in the picture is, uh, 
Anaheim Stadium, where the, where the Angels play, and uh, the Honda Center, where the Mighty Ducks play. And depending on how they're doing, they can be sometimes the unhappiest place on earth, if you happen to be. <laughs> but they're doing fairly well this time. Um, then shown on the lower right, what you've got is the, uh, that's the terminal end of the Santa Ana River, where it, where it deposits into the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Now that is tidal water in there, by the way. That's not that much water coming down from the Santa Ana River. It is usually dry. If you were to drive through the, you know, the coastal area, you look over, over the overpass, the bridge of the 405 or the five freeways, and you say, oh, it's, they call that a river? Yeah, it's, it's, because if OCWD is doing its job, there's very little base flow going in that river. So what you're looking at is tidal water there. Now, OCWD doesn't do it alone in terms of this uh, reclaimed water and surface water treatment and discharge. What they do is they, they partner with the Orange County Sanitation District, which is geographically right next door. So it's Orange County Sanitation's mission to make sure any discharges that go past all of these facilities and before they get discharged to the ocean meet certain water quality requirements. Okay, so they would take the water before it gets discharged. They would treat it and then typically discharge it through a deep ocean outfall. What they decided, they needed to upgrade that outfall a couple of decades ago and said, you know what, you know, we could spend tens of millions of dollars upgrading this outfall, or we could partner with somebody like OCWD, let's treat the water and put it back underground and have a more beneficial end use for this product. And that's how the two agencies started working together. So OCWD gets a, a a reliable water supply that they treat and inject back in the ground, and OC sanitation reduces the amount of volume they have to discharge out to the ocean. So under the groundwater replenishment system, what this system does, it purifies storm and wastewater, uh, again, surface water in, in, in terms of what the storm water delivers, um, that otherwise would be discharged to the ocean. So again, you have ocean water quality discharge issues associated with this. And they treat it up to drinking water quality. Actually, it seeds drinking water quality. And it's been operational since 2008, at which time it produced 70 million gallons today. Today, it operates around 100 MGD, because it's been expanded since 2015. And ultimately, it's going to be built out to 130 MGD. But at the current time, it's replenishing this groundwater basin with nearly 100,000 acre feet of water per year. So that's nearly enough for 850,000 people. And like I say, what they're, what they're involved in right now is this final expansion phase, which should be done in a couple of years, and that'll put them up to 130 MGD total. And that, by the way, is recognized by the Guinness World Book of Records as being the largest potable reuse program in the world. The benefits of the program, uh, this creates a new local water supply. Even when I was there at the district over 20 years ago, um, you could tell the, the overriding management thought was to have this as an independent water district, that we wouldn't have to depend on Metropolitan Water District importing water down, or we wouldn't have to just rely on uh, water coming in from the Colorado, that we could take care of ourselves locally. So local dependence was really key in what drove this, okay? so. Lack of water, drought, you know, all of these drove this, this, these types of projects, and this is the price that, uh, you know, we're willing to pay to get this water uh, available for us. You're, you're reusing a source that was once wasted. So, again, you look at it from an economic standpoint, you're going to put financial resources into these projects anyway. So why throw a bunch of money at it just to discharge it in the ocean? No, make it, take a U-turn and put it back upstream or in the ground where it can be better used for future use. And comparing it to costs, again, financially, you look at the cost compared to you know, seawater desalination or continuing to uh, operate uh, management plans that involve you know, purchasing waters from either Northern California or from the Colorado River. It also uses less energy uh, than importing water from the North and, and from the, the Colorado, as well as desalinating seawater. It improves the water quality of the basin, because as we continue to use our groundwater supplies naturally, we're replenishing it with this highly treated purified water. So over time, we are actually going to improve the water quality in the overall basin. And obviously, for the benefit of the OC Sand District, there's going to be less water there responsible for disposing out into the ocean. So basically, how it works is this. If you have, as shown in the red line, a certain amount of base flow coming down, 
to almost to the terminal end. To, to these, these, both of these plants are, are operated about six miles off the coast of, uh, of southern Orange County. It then takes a turn into the Orange County Sanitation District property where it's going to get preliminary treatment where you do some initial screening and they settle out the solids, settle out some of the grit. It then goes to a primary treatment where you're going to see some primary clarification steps. Then it goes to secondary treatment where you're going to pass it through a series of trickling filters, some aeration chambers, and then a secondary clarification step. After that, it gets shipped next door to the groundwater replenishment system on Orange County Water District's property. Right. So now you move into OCWD side of things, and at that plant, what you're doing is you're giving it some microfiltration, you're sending that stream through reverse osmosis, and then finally, ultraviolet disinfection. Okay, this, all of these steps combined will get this up to drinking water quality. And it's even known to uh, remove PFAS. There was, a, there was a presentation on this last week, and they said, yes, the, the step involved with the, with the RO on this is capable of taking care of that, that problem. So after they've treated the water, it then goes into one of two ways. About 40% of it will be sent off to the Talbert injection barrier, which helps hold back the Pacific Ocean from, from inland migration. So that stops, due to inland pumping stresses, what happens is seawater can then encroach inland. So there's an injection barrier of wells. So about 40% of the water goes to that system. And about 60% of the, of the produ produced water goes back upstream. Some of it will go into a series of um, deep basin injection wells, and some will actually go back up to the recharge area in the northern part of the Santa Ana River. Take a look at the barrier wells, for example. So there are 36 wells across this approximate three-mile span. You see the Santa Ana River there? It's shown in that blue line there on the, more or less the right side of the diagram there. And that light area is actually called the, the Talbert Gap. So it was like an incised gap, and we're in a fault-bound area here, so we had a lot of faulting activity. The darker brown area is actually uplifted areas, but the historic Santa Ana, as it carved its way through, carved this gap. So you have two high points located in the light brown, and the very light system is actually a depressed area, which is actually the, the, the flood basin of the Santa Ana River. On the lower left, what you'll see is a series of aquifers, Talbert, Alpha, Beta, and Lambda. Each of those aquifers uh, has some seawater intrusion associated with it. Now this diagram here shows that there's an injection well associated with each aquifer. So each well, 36 wells, can have three to four individual injection wells in it. The earlier ones had three to four uh, six inch wells. The modern ones that they've built over the last decade or so are usually eight to 10 inch in diameter size. And the deepest aquifer of Lambda can run down to like five or 600 feet. The shallowest Talbert aquifer is usually 100 to 150 feet deep, so just to give you some relative ranges of depth here. And combined, the, the, the barrier now puts in about 40 MGD of that highly treated GWRS water. And like I say, the other 60%, some of it goes up into a series of four deep injection wells that have been built so far, and the remaining about 50 MGD goes back up to dedicated recharge basins that are specifically made just to take this highly treated GWS water. In comparison to what the Santa Ana River water percolates versus this water, the Santa Ana River water, it'll percolate on the order of sometimes feet per day, single feet, a foot, a couple of feet per day. This can percolate up to 10 feet per day because it's much cleaner, it's much purer. It goes right through the base of the basins, right through the sidewalls. So you have a much higher percolation, much more higher efficiency of percolation when you're trying to put this GWRS water back into the ground. By contrast, let's look on the other side of the, of the coast here. We're gonna take water management in the east. And what we're dealing with here is a lot more surface water, a lot more streams, a lot more rivers. So as shown in this diagram without pointing at all, you can just sort of, you start to get the sense. There's a, there's a high concentration of rivers and streams, basically in the central part of the U.S. and as you moved eastward. I'll put it in this type of map here, which actually, this isn't the size of the rivers, by the way. This is, the more blue you see, the larger they appear. This is the amount of flow. So with this map, you're looking at, on the basis of flow, how much each of these rivers are contributing 
in terms of moving surface water, possibly taking, you know, the impacts of surface water uses with them, you know, as they move across a large geographic area. So if you've ever done a report on rivers in the U.S., you probably know there's over 250 miles of river systems within the U.S. Now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna play a little concentration here. The, the topic is gonna be U.S. rivers. So the question number one is, to the audience, what is the longest river in the U.S.? Okay, many of you are probably thinking Mississippi, but that's not right. It's the Missouri River. Okay, so know that. That's over, tw over 2,500 miles long, and it's actually the longest river in the U.S. The second longest river that happens to carry the most volume, that is the Mississippi River. Now, here's another one for you. When I am learning about, you know, river facts, uh, does anybody shout out that, what is the name of the oldest river in the United States? What is it? It's the new river. Where is it? It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly where it is. So the oldest river in the U.S. happens to have the name of New River, and it's located in West Virginia, and it drains the Appalachians. And the reasons why it's called, or now scientists debate this. Some, some you know, geophology, geomorphologists and geologists debate the age. It's between three and 10 million years old. It's based on the type of geology it's cutting through and on the overall morphology of the river itself, the, the way it courses, the size of the oxbows it has, and the number of tributaries it has coming to it. All of that leads scientists to believe it's three to, three to 10 million years old, and according to some sources, it's the second oldest river in the world and only second to the Nile River in Africa. So it makes it very interesting. So there you go, river facts, something you can take for you the rest of the day. But let's talk about uh, what's going on here locally at the Virginia plant in Hampton, uh, with Hampton Roads. And you have to talk about in terms of here, whereas the West we talked about drought, what's the driver here? What's the driver for water treatment and, 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 and discharge here? It's really a water quality. It's a coastal water quality issue. So if you're looking at water drainage into the Chesapeake Bay, for example, here, it's the largest estuary in the world. So that's a semi-enclosed, you know, coastal basin that's influenced both by surface water, you know, fresh water coming off the land, and obviously seawater. It creates a brackish environment. Um, so it's the largest estuary in the world and recognizes the third largest, um, excuse me, largest estuary in the U.S., but the third largest in the world. But it has been neg negatively impacted by nutrient loading, mostly due to farming impacts. For example, historic farming and other land uses and they, all these nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, have a number of sources. They could have come from uh, sewage treatment discharges, um, agricultural lawn fertilizers, other sources from industries that have been uh, prevalent throughout decades, and air, aerial deposition of some of these pollutants as well. If you look at that center photo, um, you'll see that, that area marked in green. That's actually the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So it extends all the way up into New York, south through Pennsylvania, then into the Washington, D.C., and greater Virginia area. So it's a very, very large area through which water drains and then deposits into the Chesapeake Bay. It's just not Virginia you know, as a source for this surface water alone. It comes a long way. But the result of all this in the center bottom is you create a condition that's known as eutrophication. You've, you've, you've removed the oxygen in this, in, this, in this area here. And that's a danger to both fish and wildlife. And as you may know, of course, in this area, as many of you may be familiar with, this area is well known for its, you know, its uh, sea, uh, seafood industry. A lot of crabbing is done for this area. And this, is, this greatly impacts that type of industry. So something needs to be done. And certain agencies are taking steps to improve the water quality due to these types of discharges. So if you looked at Hampton Roads as one example, you know, their area is in southeast Virginia. They serve over 20 cities and counties, and their service area is over 5,000 square miles. So it's a very big area. Uh, they operate 17 treatment plants, and they process over 250 million gallons a day. Again, con contrast that than the small plant I showed you in Orange County, even though it is 130 MGD, you know, it's, it's concentrating over 300 square mile area, but this one over 5,000. 
So they, their program that they've just kicked off in the last year or so, uh, planning's been going up for a long, long time, but they're just kicking off some of the construction aspects of it now. Um, they have a, what's called the SWIFT program, the Sustainable Water Infrastructure for Tomorrow. So that's their acronym for their plant. This is their research facility that's down in uh, uh, Virginia Beach. But they also utilize highly treated wastewater combined with advanced water treatment to produce a drinking water quality product. They redirect the discharge that used to go to rivers. They treat that, bring it up to water quality standards, put some of it back in the ground, and some of it goes back to the river where it eventually meets the uh, Chesapeake Bay and, and it, with the eventual goal of improving the water quality in the bay itself. It also enhances protection from sea level rise and salt water intrusion. The water that goes back in the ground, again, is going to create a pressure mound such that it'll, it'll halt the forward advancement of seawater intrusion that's known to exist in this area. And again, it's going, its primary goal is improving water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. Shown here in these couple of diagrams, you can see sort of like before and after. On the left, the current conditions here, you've got groundwater moving through, or excuse me, surface water moving through. Um, it, it would hit a water treatment plant, get treated. Again, you're putting your economic uh, uh, stresses on this kind of system here. You're spending money, but then you're discharging to the ocean. On the right, you're saying, well, let's divert that discharge and put some of it on the ground. Some of it will go back to the bay, of course, but some of it we're going to put into the ground for future use. Now, if you look at what the program looks like today and where they want to go, this is kind of a road map. And there's, a, there's five treatment plants and two pumping stations that are associated with the plan as, as they now exist. So shown here in the different dots, different colored dots, you have the different treatment plants. And if you sum of all these up, you're looking up, up over, you know, so there's a whole, over 100 MGD, like 100 to 105 MGD planned over the next 10 to 12 year period to both construct these plants, and as I'll show you, a number of water wells, recharge wells and margin wells that are associated with this program. So the question is, okay, I've spent the first half hour talking to you folks about all the surface water stuff, and when am I going to get to the drilling stuff? Well, here you go, because you're probably going, well, what's my role in all this? Well, guess what? The role of the contractor in managed aquifer recharge programs. Number one, you're the ones that provide the access to the underground conveyance aquifers and storage systems. Without your drilling of these test holes, we have really, we don't have enough information. Let's put it this way. We don't have the best and accurate information of where we think this water is going to go, what its water quality trends may be like both current and in the future, and so it needs to be monitored. So we need to have direct access to the geology to understand what's going to eventually happen to this water where we're spending all this money on treating. Secondly, you know, it's through the construction of the wells that you achieve the goals of the program. These programs don't work without properly designed, constructed, operated, maintained wells. That's key. That's where our role is. So we are involved in these programs. They may, be, they may be engineering marvels, and they may get all the awards. But it actually comes down to the, the work of the people done like you in this room. Thirdly, you need to construct monitoring programs. In other words, you need to construct monitoring wells to assess the performance of the plants that you just built. You don't, this isn't a one and done deal. You don't, don't dr drill a recharge well. You don't just drill a production well and say, that's it, it's running turn the lights off, go away. No. These wells need constant monitoring. And as an overall program, you need to constantly assess what is the effectiveness of this program and is it meeting the goal. So therefore, you need to have a series of monitoring wells to do just that, checking the water quality, checking the water levels over time. And lastly, just like anything else, you build it, now you own it, now you maintain it. So you, it's the contractors that are going to come in and maintain these wells. You're going to maintain the recharge wells, the production wells. You're going to utilize better rehab, uh, rehabilitation techniques. You're going to recognize the symptoms of the wells sooner. And you're going to utilize many of the crafts that you learned today in terms of well rehab. But maybe there's some that haven't been developed yet. But it's through these types of programs those will come about. So you have a very, very key role to play in, the, in, in terms of what can you do in terms of you know, being involved in managed aquifer recharge programs. 
So let's swing back to these specific programs and what, what can you do now? Well, there's a number of programs here. There, are, there were five key areas, five key phases that Hampton Roads has identified where wells are going to be drilled. And this is preliminary, but this is what they're looking at right now. This phase one, James one, they want James River, excuse me, um, looking at overall capacity of 16 MGD. 10 recharge wells are planned. Three of them have already been put out to bid. The other ones are going to come out to bid early next year. But the average depth of those is like 1,100 feet deep. You look at the other four plants, uh, the other four systems, those are all going to be done in the next 10, 12 years. So you've got about 65 wells just planned right now. There may be more, and I'm only showing you the recharge wells, not the number of monitoring wells that are associated with these systems. And these are anywhere from 1,100 to 2,000 feet deep. So these are serious programs that today's contractor must understand that this is where the industry is going. And you've got to get her up, and you've got to get ready. Because even if you don't drill them, maybe you're the person who wants to come in and do the monitoring wells. And if you don't do that, maybe you're the person who wants to come in and do the rehabilitation. It's going to take everyone's skill set to make these types of programs work. Now, I'm going to call out, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, but Mark Williams is sitting right there. Mark, raise your hand. <laughs> Mark the, is the hydrogeologist in charge of, the, of looking at this program right now, and he's got a lot of information about this program, and he would welcome you to talk to him after the program. Um, and he gladly would uh, take on your help, your assistance, and helping push these programs through. So that's just an example. This is one of the test wells. This is one of the very early pilot wells Hampton Roads uh, has done. And what I visit there, it just comes from these very early, early pictures. Um, this is from AC Schulte's contractors, and it shows them drilling a pilot well. Um, this estimated to go down about 1,400 feet. They utilize both 316L and a, a duplex 2205 steel going into this well. But with the final completion, the actual injection casing itself is 18-inch uh, casing and screen. In addition to those wells, uh, USGS came in and they put in an extensometer. Now, why did they do this? Because, again, in the overall assessment of the program's goals, what is it doing? It's not just a volume amount we want to look at here, but in this case here, they're saying, well, what are you actually doing to the land? Are, are you putting water in that's going to cause either a sort of like a rebound effect on the land or is it going to cause a depression when the system is off? How much is that? Is there some movement we can, de we, we can determine actually in the local ground service due to these injection activities? Well, it's this kind of structure that will help us determine what that actually is and monitor that. If I go back to Orange County Water District, this is what they've done. Before they could even embark on that SWIFT, on their uh, GWRS program, they had to know what their basin was. And that, this was part of the goal when I started there, you know, over 30 years ago. Um, it was our goal to put in a, a network of groundwater monitoring wells to really assess what this basin really was doing. It's not just a bathtub. It's a very highly complex bathtub with different types of water quality and all kinds of faulting activity going on, which is displacing an awful lot of those groundwater aquifers. So the different types of wells we, we had there at Orange County Water District, we had West Bay wells, right? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with those, but they, they utilize a straddle packer type methodology to isolate certain water bearing zones from which you can get uh, distinct water quality and water level information. That was one way we had to discern what different layers of our, our, of our bathtub look like. And that's what told us, no, you've got different aquifer systems, different prevailing heads, different water quality values associated with different depths, for example. So this is one way you can accomplish that. Other ways you do it is through the nested well program. That's where you have a single boring, a 24-inch boring, and you set down two, three, um, four-inch wells, for example, all staggered over different water quality zones, different uh, water levels, excuse me. The last one is a well cluster. That's where we have separate wells, but in close proximity to each other. But each one is its own separate borehole and its own separate casing. But all of these are used to collect water level and water quality information. And with that information, you're able to better define what the hydrogeology character is of that basin. Now, we couldn't put together a cross-section like this with the information we had in, in the mid-'80s. It just wouldn't have been, it would just would have been cartoonish, and it just would have said, okay, well, it kind of looks like this, we get this water flowing here. But 
With a diagram like this, now you're really understanding there's a shallow aquifer system, it behaves this way. The middle aquifer system gets recharged and behaves this way when it's stressed, and we have the deep aquifer system, which has undesirable water in it, but could be treated at some time in the future when it's economically feasible. It has a colored water issue. It just means it has a likely, like a iced tea colored uh, quality to it. Water quality is not bad, but you can't serve the public water with that kind of tint to it. But we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have the high uh, complexity of those uh, monitor wells established at the time. So once you understand how your basin works, where the water goes in, where it goes, how it moves, how fast it moves, or how slowly it moves, now you can start thinking about, well, what's my recharge program going to look like? So after they're understanding that, and they also looked at, we're looking at local water levels, where are the depressions in this basin due to overpumping? And where would this GWRS water resource we now have, where can we plug it in to help fill those gaps, to help fill those depressed areas of the basin? Well, OCWD has four deep injection wells that strictly take GWRS water and inject it into the ground. The 316L steel, they're down to about 1,100 feet, and they were completed with 16-inch 16 16 inch diameter steel. And this is best drilling, uh, well-known contract in the Southern California area. Now, with all this data, you can collect it, you can send a staff of people out, Water quality people go out and collect samples. You can send your staff out to collect all kinds of water level data. If it just sits in a notebook, it's not doing anybody any good. You have to take that data. You have to look at it, you have to analyze it. You don't look at data, point, data points only, but you look at trends in those points. It's the trends that tell you the story. Where are we going? What's our water quality doing? You know, how am I going to impact this? If I, if I do this step, what's going to happen over here? And this is where you develop, the district has also developed, in their case, a highly sophisticated computer model that can tell them, hey, with the data I have now, if I would just take a certain area of this basin, and I know the behavior of what's going on here, and I know there's injection wells or production wells, what's going to happen aerially if I activate those wells? What's going to happen in the near well zone? What's going to happen to the nearby city? What's going to happen to well, this city's well, if this, this city's well does this, if they put two wells on, what's going to happen over here? You can run scenarios like they're going to operate nine wells simultaneously. They'll operate four wells simultaneously. Are they injection wells or recharge wells, or maybe both? So through sophisticated computer models, which can only be run and managed and operated if you have good data going into them, now you really have an overall groundwater management tool. So in conclusion, we find that service and groundwater really are bound together, either by natural means, through the hydrologic cycle, and as practiced by Mother Nature. But we have a role too, scientists and engineers and contractors and practitioners, we can see how we can help influence that in a positive way. Groundwater is not just an entity, groundwater becomes a resource when it's accessed through properly constructed wells. So we make good of that water that's down there through our practice of doing good work, you know, constructing properly drilled wells, proper monitoring, proper assessment, proper rehabilitation of these same systems. Responsible groundwater management incorporates replenishment elements to sustain these resources now into the future. I think we, everybody pretty much understands it can't be a one-way street in terms of production. We especially recognize this in the West. We can't keep drawing down our groundwater basins, our groundwater supplies, and expect Mother Nature to answer the call because she's not calling. So, so we have to take these steps to find other water resources that are available, treat them, and help augment these supplies. You, everybody out there, you have a vital role to play in the ongoing and future developments in the groundwater and surface water management you know, style. This is, this is just where we're going that we just simply can't keep taking water from the ground and think it's going to be sustainable forever. There's got to be a new mode of thought, and that is, whatever we take out, there's got to be an input mode put in. For every output, there's an input. That's got to be thought. That's part of the overall management scheme. So, as I would impress upon you, if you call it the 0.2% the of the population serving the 0.1% of the total groundwater supply, get involved. Stay involved. 
stay close to your uh, customers, stay, stay close to the types of districts that are doing and the entities that are doing these types of programs, and don't be afraid to speak out. I know when I started on these programs and we went down looking at these monitoring wells, you know, they were the first times, for example, the West Bay wells were utilized in, 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 in the U.S. to that degree. And the local contractors didn't know really, well, how am I going to do this multi-port? You want me to do a, you know, let me get this straight. You want, a, you want a seal, and then you want a transition sand, then you want a sand, and then you want a transition sand, and another seal, and all of that. You want that all in 10 feet? And, and it's like, you have to learn how to work with contractors, and contractors have to understand exactly what you're trying to do. So I try to teach, you know, other geologists, other engineers to understand the same thing. Partner with the contractor community. You know, partner with the redevelopers so that you understand what actually you're getting into so that you do get the, the results you want and you will achieve that. So stay involved is my advice. And with that, thank you very much for your time and coming to see me this morning. If there's any time for questions, I'd be happy to field them. Right. Thank you. None? Coffee break. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate your time. I hope to see many of you at your state chapters. Um, if you've had, you had the opportunity to uh, go through the section and, and get me involved in your uh, speaking tour, just let me know. I'll be, uh, be happy to show up. But anyway, thank you for your time this morning. Have a great rest of the show. Uh, and I want to wish you Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Thank you.